Episode 15 of The Complete Bachelor by Oliver Onions. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Episode 15 Settling Day. Caroline was married and with a decent tear had left for a month's sweet lunacy under blue skies and on the Mediterranean terraces i had bestowed an appropriate valediction at victoria station to the accompanying exhalation of steam the slamming of doors and the waving of a green flag and had returned to my flat it had not appeared quite the same to me i had peeped into the little room that had been so long her own and a sense of emptiness and unfamiliarity had struck me leaving little desire to make friends with it my own rooms were structurally unchanged, but a corded and labelled trunk, left to be called for after the bridal trip, seemed to occupy the whole place to my utter exclusion, and unsettled me greatly. I perceived that virtue had gone out from these lifeless shells of apartments, and my feline attachment to the building itself was not sufficiently strong to reconcile me to an immediate resumption of the old order of things on the whole i did not waste much sentiment over the matter but spoke a word to mrs loring's ear received an invitation from some friends of hers in the country left my chairs and canvas and my blinds in full mourning and made haste to lawns and trim clipped hedges till i should summon resolution to face the fresh conditions this gave mrs loring a certain opportunity which as i had foreseen she was little likely to waive and which also suited my mood admirably overhead the rooks were holding their sage sustained conference and i i believe nodding gravely and judicially when an undefined sense of intruding mortals caused me to blink through my lashes mrs loring and millicent were slowly crossing the lawn in my direction their white gowns dipping from orange to grey and grey to orange as they traversed the belts of light mrs loring was talking this be it said was mrs loring's supreme opportunity i had no wish to listen it was forced on my passive ears i suppose she was saying now that caroline's gone he must i know that cicely vickers told me you can do what you like with a man who feels a little bit sorry for himself millicent she did this seemed somehow to concern me i had doubtless felt somewhat low but had no idea i had showed it so plainly as that anyway cicely vickers doubtless knew millicent replied i don't think it's fair molly to talk like that rollo butterfield isn't a fool and i dare say charlie vickers isn't such a fool as he was then thank you dear lady he isn't a fool mrs loring replied but i do call it criminal simply criminal that a man who is getting older and fatter every week should keep putting off and putting off for no reason at all except that he's ashamed to give in after so long it's rank breach of promise i know rollo butterfield these were hard words to hear of oneself apparently mrs loring's one desire was that that presence of mine fat hang her impudence should hold decently together through a marriage service and run to seedy corpulence immediately afterwards for all she cared but millicent vindicated me nobly if rollo butterfield molly was prepared to marry me to keep me in countenance with all the people we know i'd never let him propose to me which he hasn't done by the way but you don't understand him a little bit he's not much fatter my dear saving your presence than loring and anyway he'll be a young man when loring's uh, you understand me and you can't say very much more to me on the subject molly you'll have to propose to him yourself then milly said mrs loring with a worldly shrug i should not be afraid to do that millicent retorted defiantly i should like to be there when it happened mrs loring's tone expressed the most off-hand incredulity at the affair being ever definitely settled there was a silence as they approached and discovered my presence 
now i had never been in the least resentful of mrs loring chatterton's self-arrogated responsibility for my welfare and millicent's it had always been too open and frank to be regarded as interference but in that moment she had given me a hint that i felt half inclined to act upon suppose she really were there when it happened i rose to meet them welcome dear ladies i said you almost caught me napping i believe i have been dreaming and seemed to hear voices i looked at millicent and thought she understood but it did not occur to mrs loring that i might have overheard you dream a good deal nowadays mr butterfield don't you she said somewhat assiduously i fear mrs loring i replied that i have lately done it to an extent that is almost criminal she was still unenlightened but i saw that millicent guessed i made places for them on either side of me but mrs loring hesitated standing no chance is too trivial for a matchmaker sit down mrs loring i said making myself comfortable just out of the sun she sat down i continued i have been watching the sunset here all alone it is a lovely evening you and loring have doubtless been sitting hand in hand waiting for the twilight no the surroundings seemed to call for that kind of thing somehow don't you think i'm glad to hear you say so mr butterfield i have hopes of you even yet the evening certainly inspires such such things providing they are strictly en regle most decidedly i assented that must always be understood i admit that it is a delicate matter that there are times when even the most permissible caress becomes unseasonable just as at others an unseasonable one is almost permissible but as a general rule such proceedings must be as you say strictly en regle i find you in a most reasonable mood this evening mr butterfield she approved with a glance at millicent dreaming evidently does you good pray continue i acknowledged her encouragement and went on it must be taken for granted first of all that the endearments is a bondi fide guarantee in which case publicity is not only unnecessary but impertinent a third person for instance could not possibly take the slightest interest in it it would be highly unbecoming she assented quite so i replied half absently and that is where the kindly interest of say the married chaperone fails in the moment that her presence becomes most necessary it becomes superfluous is not that so if you mean mr butterfield that i she said making a movement as if to rise my dear mrs loring i replied we are discussing a perfectly abstract question you appear to be able to deal only with a concrete case then she retorted the sunset has done you less good than i thought an abstract case on an evening like this and her eyes appeared to fill with pity for millicent that lady looked up but said nothing it is on such evenings mrs loring i returned that nothing but the presence of the chaperone divides the abstract from the concrete then you do mean she said almost impetuously does it occur to you mrs loring i replied that you are speaking with remarkable freedom mrs loring was in a difficult position to stay was to nullify the opportunity and to postpone indefinitely so she thought the consummation of her disinterested endeavours to leave on the other hand was a hint so pointed that even she felt it might give rise to an embarrassment that would defeat its own ends i pointed this out to her of course in an entirely abstract way and millicent i was pleased to see regarded the comedy with an amused coolness that had in it very little sympathy for mrs loring chatterton and her methods she looked up laughing it would be rather a difficult position for any chaperone to be placed in she said mischievously wouldn't it molly molly was rather at a loss a chaperone's is a difficult position altogether milly she said and it means considerable self-sacrifice on the part of the one who undertakes it it is a thankless office i replied but in the case of impetuous youth i suppose it is necessary 
hot blood mrs loring must be watched she was getting puzzled and evidently losing her hold on the situation after all she answered doubtfully when one has confidence in people perhaps it doesn't matter so much it is dangerous i warned her when young recklessness takes the bit between its teeth and plunges headlong into a course of matrimony millicent smiled at the description as applied to ourselves some calmer ruling is almost essential personally i think that at all proposals an appointed authority should conduct the ceremonies one cannot manage such affairs alone she didn't quite catch the suggestion it is perfectly unnecessary she replied indeed i asked and suppose the affair hung fire and the proposal never came at all imagine the sorrow of the goddess outside the machine i almost think she has a right to insist on personal supervision i think you are talking a great deal of nonsense she replied then mrs loring you fail to follow me take a case say in which the woman proposes i suppose you will admit the possibility the man might be a fool or dilatory or getting fat mrs loring chatterton suddenly turned on me looked me up down widthways and through and found no speech i returned her look and millicent broke into unrestrained laughter the light that came to the goddess outside the machine was too much for her coherence rollo butterfield and you too millicent dixon millicent mr butterfield how dare you sir you listened i didn't say it you didn't say what mrs loring i asked oh don't take the trouble to feign innocence i always thought mr butterfield i never stop laughing millicent this is not a farce i didn't think mr butterfield that you would use at least anything you heard in so discreditable a manner mrs loring i answered i did not listen i was dreaming dreaming does me good and i heard the rooks calling and several other things quite against my will besides i added if you will consider a moment don't you think i was too deeply concerned in your friendly aspersions not to have some kind of right in them i wish to put the thing euphoniously you understand mrs loring but haven't you interested yourself too long in what concerns me first of all to take up any position of outraged propriety now i awaited her reply my eyes on her face i should have been sorry to fall out with mrs loring i had had too much amusement out of her to take her too seriously and i recognized that meddling was too harsh a word for her conduct for a full minute she sat looking straight in front of her and then smiled all was well i'm sorry for you millicent she said for the first time i have doubts as to your happiness with this creature i may yet have to repent that ever i gathered you both under my wing rollo butterfield you think i'm laughing but i'm not i haven't forgiven you you reserve your forgiveness mrs loring till no further evasion is possible you are still permit me to remind you premature i looked at millicent whose face expressed the greatest relish for the whole scene millicent understood and cared as little for mrs loring's presence as i did myself a new recklessness took possession of me so long as she knew i didn't give a schoolgirl's kiss what happened mrs loring was making uneasy motions and had attempted several false starts with the object of leaving us alone i took millicent's hand imprisoned it in both my own and looked squarely at mrs loring she sat spellbound fascinated a wedding guest who could not choose but hear millicent i said and paused rollo she replied mrs loring made another attempt to break away sit in the middle mrs loring i said and we made the rearrangement i turned again to millicent mrs loring says you are to propose to me millicent mrs loring says you would be ashamed to give in after so long rollo you are afraid millicent that i shall say it sudden i am not afraid of anything that you will say 
or do she added as i took her hands across miss loring then i replied i have the honour to ask you miss dixon this was too much for mrs loring she burst through our hands and stood trembling staring lost hysterical then fled when the moon a timid debutante in a faint sky rose behind the clipped box hedge we were still in the arbour millicent and i one of her hands shone with an unaccustomed jewel it had been my mother's ring and her other was in my personal and private keeping i believe rollo she said that you are still little more than a boy millicent i replied i realize less now than ever the prospect of being grown up i am merely grown out though scarcely more so than loring i added she laughed at the recollection and you didn't mind proposing to me i said i shouldn't have minded proposing to you rollo had you not did i propose to you then millicent i'm sure i don't know she replied perhaps molly had her wish after all anyway it didn't make much difference end of episode fifteen end of the complete bachelor by oliver onions